Ketamine is an NMDA receptor antagonist and a dissociative anesthetic that has been found to rapidly ameliorate depressive symptoms in treatment-resistant patients. Recent studies also suggest that serotonergic psychedelics, such as psilocybin, may possess rapid antidepressant effects. Are these psychoactive drugs acting through completely different mechanisms, as their primary pharmacological targets would make one think, or do their effects converge on certain neurobiological mechanisms? This will be the topic of today's video. Welcome to my channel. My name is Samuel Kohtala, I'm a neuropharmacologist studying the mechanisms of drug action in the brain. Today I'll discuss some ideas of the neuropharmacological similarities between ketamine and psychedelic drugs. Ketamine is a thoroughly tested and proven rapid-acting antidepressant drug, but for psychedelics, the clinical evidence of their effectiveness is still very preliminary. Future studies may well demonstrate that psychedelics belong to the clinical arsenal of rapid-acting antidepressant drugs. This, of course, begs the question, why do pharmacotherapies like ketamine and serotonergic psychedelics, which appear mechanistically distinct and target different receptors, still share such similar therapeutic potential? Arguably, one of the most pronounced features of these drugs is their ability to produce altered states of consciousness. Indeed, some hypothesize that these drugs may produce profound psychological change through the subjective experiences that emerge under the effects of these drugs. However, the subanesthetic doses of ketamine given to depressed patients are thought to produce only mild and relatively transient psychotropic effects. For example, a recent study that looked at these effects found that around 50% of patients receiving ketamine experienced something similar to psychedelics, like the sensation of floating, while 80% reported feeling strange, weird or bizarre. Of course, the subjective experiences produced by ketamine and serotonergic psychedelics can be qualitatively quite different. But it can be argued that, generally, serotonergic psychedelics, at least with the doses used in the current clinical studies, produce much more profound psychoactivity. Many studies of psychedelics suggest that their therapeutic effects may be related to the quality of the subjective experience. For ketamine, this line of research has received far less attention. A systematic review of eight studies found that the relationship between dissociation and antidepressant effects was mixed. Only three of the eight analyses found a relationship between the antidepressant response and a dissociation scale. But then again, these dissociation scales are not particularly designed to measure the psychotropic effects produced by ketamine. Moreover, there are too few studies of either serotonergic psychedelics or ketamine to truly assess the significance of the subjective experience, and this remains an important but open question. A second perspective is more related to the cellular and molecular aspects. Recent studies suggest that both ketamine and serotonergic psychedelics facilitate changes in neuroplasticity, which can be measured, for example, as changes in neurite growth, synapse formation or altered synaptic strength. Both ketamine and psychedelic drugs appear to increase the expression of certain genes related to the regulation of plasticity. For example, most studies have shown that ketamine injections upregulate brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF gene expression and translation across the cortex and also in the hippocampus. These effects have also been observed with psychedelics like LSD and DOI. Both ketamine and psychedelics appear to facilitate increases in the formation of dendritic spines. 
Some of these effects have been associated with the activation of the mammalian target of rapamycin, a key cascade controlling protein synthesis, among other things. There are also studies which suggest that the antidepressant-like effects of both ketamine and psychedelics are abolished by antagonists of either mTOR or Track b receptors. Moreover, in some studies, the effects of psychedelics are abolished by pretreatment with 5-HT2A receptor antagonists. But there are also studies that suggest otherwise. Check out my video on psilocybin and 5-HT2A receptors for a review of this particular study. Now, a key shared mechanism that may explain the effects of both of these drugs is their ability to produce a surge in the release of the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. For ketamine, the facilitation of glutamatergic signaling is well established, and there's also preliminary evidence suggesting that psychedelics may have similar actions in the brain. The idea is that these drugs may trigger a surge in glutamate, which then facilitates AMPA receptor throughput, triggering BDNF release and the activation of downstream mechanisms like mTOR. Conversely, AMPA receptor antagonists are known to block the antidepressant-like effects of ketamine in rodents. Unfortunately, AMPA receptors have not been studied that much in the context of psychedelic drugs. But some studies do suggest that AMPA receptor activation is important for the behavioral effects of drugs like DOI, and that blockade of 5-HT2A receptors also blocks the effects on glutamate release. Here it is important to remember that the different psychedelic drugs are not a very homogeneous group and that the effects of various psychedelics differ on many levels and can have very different receptor binding profiles. But in light of the current knowledge, we can hypothesize that the molecular mechanisms of psychedelics and ketamine share the tendency for the facilitation of glutamatergic signaling. This may then produce neural responses that promote synaptic plasticity and that this synaptic plasticity is useful for producing the ultimate therapeutic outcomes. That's pretty much it for today. If you're interested in ketamine's pharmacology or some of the ideas I uh, described in this video, uh, please check out the description down below where I have listed my previous videos explaining some of the key ideas also discussed here. And also remember to subscribe for future neuropharmacology content. Thank you for watching and until next time.